Good morning. <laughs> wow, it's, uh, it's good to be here. I'm honored uh, to be at uh, this church. And I love uh, Chris and Hillary uh, Cooper, uh, Cooper, uh, Cuba. And uh, I've known him since he was a little boy. And it's good to be with him in, in, in his church. Uh, the title uh, 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 for the series we're in is, uh, I understand, is I Am Whatever. And of course today, my assignment is, I am insecure. And I got to be honest, I am <laughs> insecure. And the reason is, in my whole life, I, uh, um, I happen to be a stutterer. Now, all that really means is that uh, I stutter. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to brag or anything, but actually, I'm a pretty good stutterer. I stutter really well. Now, you stutter as a speaker, a preacher guy, and of course, I know it has to be weird for you, the audience. I, mean, I know it has to be weird to be sitting up there, and you just heard that your speaker for the next 35 minutes is a stutterer. And you're thinking whatever you're thinking. You're feeling sorry for the guy. You're thinking, why do we have to have the stutter? I don't know what you're thinking. But, but let me set your mind's ease because in one sense, being a stutterer really is a, a no big deal uh, unless you want to say something. <laughs> and believe me, it's going to be a factor. And all of my life, it's been a factor. I can honestly say if stuttering has done anything for me, it has definitely made my life exciting in that I never know in any situation I'm in if I'm going to be able to say something or not. And believe me, I've been in thousands of situations all of my life where I've had something to say, wanted to say it, and just had an exciting time trying to get it said. It, 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 it uh, affected me as a kid. Now, I don't stutter as well as I, I used to stutter as a kid, but uh, as a kid, I was a great stutter. I, Actually, I may have stuttered as well as anybody has ever stuttered as a kid. I'm not sure if they keep those kind of stats or not. But as a kid, I couldn't talk. Couldn't say my name. Couldn't say hello. Couldn't, couldn't talk on the phone. In fact, I'd be at the house when I was a little guy, and our phone would ring. And every now and then, I'd try to answer it. And I did this so many times. Get the receiver, pick it up, get stuck, start the stutter. Couldn't say anything, so I'd just hang up on them. I used to call people all the time. They answered the phone. I never got anything. I'd just hang up and try back later. I mean, it, it affected me in every area of life. It affected me as a kid. affected me as a student. I mean, every uh, everything about school was a challenge for me. I mean, reading was a major challenge. Speech class was a major adventure for me. A Spanish class. Now, if you can imagine me stuttering in English, you should have heard me stutter in Spanish. It was really impressive. <laughs> but it affected me all the way through, and it affected me as a kid, as a student, and also as an athlete. Now, I played football. I happened to play quarterback. Now, <laughs> uh, normally, uh, a guy who plays that position, you know, uh, uh, usually, you need to be able to talk. You got to call plays in the huddle. You got to say hutch to the line of scrimmage. You got to change the play at the line of scrimmage. And of course, all that happens in highly stressful, time sensitive situations where for me, it was just always exciting. Now, when I was in high school, all you were allowed in high school to call a play and get everyone up to the line of scrimmage, get the ball set, was 25 seconds. That's all you got. Well, often it is one enough time for me to say all the stuff I had to say. And uh, so I'd be in the huddle uh, calling a play. I get stuck. Um, I start the stutter, uh, 25 seconds runs out, referee throws a flag, we lose five yards for the last game. So I'm costing us a lot, a lot of yardage. So my coach devised a system whereby if I was on the field, I never had to say anything. And the way he did that, we had, uh, in the huddle, I had a split in, he always, he always stood right beside me in the huddle, his name was Steve Thomas. Steve called every play for me in the huddle. He'd say the formation, say the play, say the snap count, say ready, break. So basically, basically, I didn't have to do a thing in the huddle because Steve said everything for me. In fact, my coach had said, Neil, you just be on a knee in the huddle and kind of act like you're doing something. But he said, he also said, don't open your mouth because it just confuses everybody. So Steve said everything for me in the huddle. We'd break the huddle, hustle up on the line of scrimmage. And once we reached the line of scrimmage, I had a fullback. He always lined up right behind me in the I formation. His name was Stu Cropper. Stu would say all of the huts for me at the line of scrimmage. And it was so unique at the start of every ball game just to watch that initial reaction of the defense, when Stu would be saying those huts, of course, he, he's in a stage, you can't even see him, and I'd just be smiling, and I'm just there kind of. <laughs> of course, nobody, uh, everybody's saying, oh, where are those huts coming from? Who's saying those huts? But it's always affected me. All through high school, it affected me. I went to Baylor University. I actually played at Baylor. Uh, 
Uh, I've always been a Baylor fan all my life. I was raised a Baylor fan, which means I've suffered all my life except for these last couple of years. <laughs> really good. But I get to Baylor for the first practice my uh, freshman year at Baylor. Uh, first day of practice, first day or two days, the first time I'm there, and I'm stuttering extremely well. And it was hard on me. It was hard on all the players and all the coaches. Everybody was one. And what made it worse was nobody there actually knew I stuttered. I had failed to mention that to anybody. And so I'm having a hard time calling the plays. And of course, it was a tense situation. And, and everybody's wondering what's up with this freshman quarterback. We can't even talk. I mean, it, it was just awful. Well, halfway through that first practice, Coach Taft, who was our coach at Baylor at the time, a great guy, great Christian, great man, loved, uh, 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 he loved us. He saw the situation, saw the effect he was having on me, and everybody showed he calls me over the sideline. And we talk about my problem. And I say, Coach, I'm a stutterer. It's, it's not always this bad. Uh, sometimes it's worse. And, uh, we discussed it. We talked about it. He asked me a bunch of questions about stuttering. One of the questions he asked me was, was he asked me if I stuttered when I sang. Because I thought to myself, well, uh, 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 no, sir, I can't explain this, but I can uh, sing without stuttering. He said, Neil, why don't you try this next time? Just try stepping in the huddle and kind of sing a play to the guys. Well, <laughs> I was only a freshman, and I was obviously deaf, so I stepped in there as soon as it was my time again, and, and I was only about, you know, a 180-pound freshman. I stepped in there with all these big linemen and big upperclassmen and just kind of sang them something like, uh, slot, slot, right, X49GY, cross X, something like that. And it, it loosened everybody up. And it helped me so much, and it was so much easier to stutter, to sing the play instead of stuttering through the play. I kept singing the play. And after a while, it was kind of, kind of, kind of fun and novel, and everybody was getting into this thing, and it was kind of unique. And, and after a while, I started to ask if anybody had any requests when he would be singing the play to, and I, I tried to sing it for him. And, and we stayed with there for several practices until one of our centers, Aubrey Schultz, she walks up to Coach. Uh, a few days later, it said, Coach, all the guys had decided that we would rather hear him stutter than have to listen to him sing. But <laughs> I say all of that just so you'll know, hey, I'm a stutterer, and I've struggled all of my life, and I've always felt insecure. You know, I got a thousand funny stories about uh, stuttering and things and, and dating and all that stuff. But you know what? When I was a kid, uh, it wasn't funny. And I was struggling, just all, always felt inferior, always, never wanted to be me, didn't like who I was. Why do I have to stutter? That's because the stutterer is so ashamed of how he talks. He's ashamed of how he looks when he talks. He makes all these faces. I mean, his eyes, his, his head nod, uh, 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 bobs, his eyes blink. I mean, I've seen myself, it's ugly, I know that. He's so ashamed of how he looks when he talks, and he's so ashamed of how he sounds when he, 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 he talks, because he messes up with the words. It just never sounds right. A stutterer struggles with uh, the feelings of feeling stupid because you never say anything right, and you feel ugly just because of the way you look as you do it, and the response you get from everybody around you when you're trying to say something that is laughing. I just struggled all of my life. I didn't want to be me. When I was in grade school, I wanted to be Mark Mentier, the coolest guy in our grade school. Yes, I wanted to be Mark Mentier. When I was in junior high, it was Randy Fagan. When I was in high school, it was Steve Thomas, my split, and he called the plays in the huddle. In college, it was 100 guys I wanted to be. I was never, never happy about who I was and always felt insecure. The greatest struggle I had was I didn't feel worthy to be loved because I didn't feel uh, lovable. I didn't feel like there was anything worthy about me to be valued and to be loved. So I thought, you know, I got to do something to be loved. And for me, it was playing sports. And I discovered, hey, if I could just perform on the field, on the court, whatever it is, just play well, just do something really good, and I did, if I could just do that, maybe I'd be accepted by people around me as a person of worth and value, and maybe if they accepted me, I was always hoping I'd be able to accept myself. I just always felt so in. Uh, secure. And you know, I had some success as an athlete. I mean, I played at, in, in high school, played at uh, uh, Baylor, ended up playing a couple of years in the, in the NFL with the San Diego Chargers. But you know what the problem is? Having to perform to be loved and valued, you always have to keep 
perform it. You got to do the little dance. And if you ever stop doing the dance, or you don't do it well, or you have a bad game, or you get cut, or you don't start anymore, and all of a sudden it's all over, you lose your reason to be valued and loved. The greatest thing I've ever discovered in my life. When I was a sophomore in high school, I discovered there's a God in heaven who loved me just like I am. As a stutterer, as a sinner, and as a guy who just has struggled with so much, and I still struggle with stuff, but there's a God in heaven who loves me, who values me. The attuned, and, and this is my message. I've got two points. One is I discovered that God loved me. And you know the second point is? I discovered that God would use me. He had a plan for my life. First is God, God loved me. You know, I discovered a couple of reasons that just told me how much he loved me. You know one reason why you can know God loves and values you? Because you know what, chances are, I can stand up here and confess I am insecure. Probably every person in the room could stand up and say, you know what, I'm insecure. Because we all have struggles in this area. You know one reason I discovered why God loves me? You know why God loves, loves me? You know why he loves you? For no other reason than God created you. He created me, which makes me a person of worth and value because I didn't just happen. A great, omniscient, powerful God of the universe created me through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, uh, this whole idea of the creator value his creation, I didn't understand that totally until my wife and I were expecting our first child. Now, she was expecting more than I was, but, but I, was, I was involved in this thing. You know, we're going to all those classes and so forth. August 3rd, 1980, she starts having labor. We rushed to the hospital. Twelve hours we were in labor. Again, she more than I, but, but I was right there. At 12.06, August 3rd, 1980, I watched the most incredible thing I've ever experienced in my life. I watched the birth of my friend. And, and actually how it happened, I'm, I'm actually in the room. I don't know how they do it today. I don't think they do it like this anymore, but I'm actually in the room. And I'm actually, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm actually on the, on the south side of this thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, I'm watching, I'm watching the miracle of birth. Hey, just a side note. I don't know how a man can watch the miracle of birth happen and not know there's got to be a great God in heaven. <laughs> but I'm there watching this whole thing happen, and all of a sudden, I mean, I'm weeping, I'm overwhelmed, and I just watch this thing. And, 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 and it happens. She's born. Dr. Smith uh, uh, takes her. He measures her and does that stuff. He, he, he uh, 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 cleans her up. And then you know what he does? He hands her to me. <laughs> now, here I am, 27 years old at the time, holding seven pounds, 10 ounces worth of flesh. The thought hits me. She has no idea who I am. She's never done anything worth her life. She hasn't performed. She hasn't been a cheerleader. She hasn't played sports. She hasn't, she's done nothing except cry her whole life at that point. <laughs> but you know what I, I was so overwhelmed was? As I held Natalie and Marie Jeffrey in my hands, how much I loved that baby girl. You know why? She's mine. Through, through God's creative process, Sheila and I have a baby girl and a child now 42 years old named Natalie. Now, here's my point. Imagine if a sinful, messed up, screwed up father feels that kind of love toward his own baby girl. Imagine how a perfect, loving God in heaven feels about you. <laughs> you know why he loves you? Not because of how you look, not because of what you do, not because of what you got, not because if you measure up to what the whole world is or the whole social media thing. God could care less about any of this. God has a plan, has a purpose. And the Bible says God has inscribed, Isaiah 49, 16, God has inscribed you, engraved you in the palms of his hand. Which simply means God holds us just like I held Natalie Marie Jeffrey. He loves you. And you know what the fact is? Hey, 
You can spend your whole life in rebellion against God. Never say yes to Jesus Christ. Never commit your life to Him. Never walk in holiness. Never join a church. Never do anything. Just rebel against God your whole life. Does not change the fact how much He loves you. Because He created you. And you're here with a plan and a purpose. You know what? I always thought, and, and I'm going to hit this a little bit more as well, but I always thought, hey, I was a mistake in this whole thing. The reason I stuttered is because something happened and it was a mistake. And, and I, I struggle with that for, for a lot of you. But you know what I'm realizing? Hey, God don't make no mistakes. God don't make no junk. I realize, I mean, I'm 68 years old and I'm at the end of this thing. Looking back on a whole life of struggle and stuttering. And I can see, I can see now what my mom used to say when I was a little kid just struggling and crying. I come home from school just crying. She wrapped me up in her, her to laugh and pray for me. You know what she would always say? Hey, son, I know this is a struggle. I know this is hard. But hey, there's a God in heaven who loves you. You know, there's a God who's going to use this somehow in some way. And it's like, we're going to trust him. I kept saying, no way. After all these years, yes way there is. God can. God will. That's the point. God loves you because he created you and he values you because you are here. You know, a second reason I discovered that God loves and values me. One, God created me. Two, Jesus Christ died for me, which tells me how much he loves me, how much I am valued by him. Uh, uh, actually, let me just read this verse. In, 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 uh, I really don't have a time. Uh, Romans 5, but just, 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 uh, just, it, it just reminds us, and uh, I don't have time to really um, uh, uh, actually just talk about it. But it's Romans 5, 6. It just reminds us again how much... Uh, God loves us. It says in verse 6, while we were still weak, I mean helpless, insecure, messed up, dysfunctional, while I am like that, totally messed up in my life, while I am still weak at the right time, Christ still died for the young godly. Jesus Christ still died for me. One would scarcely die for a righteous man, verse 7 says, though perhaps for a good person one would even die. But this is the second thing. Uh, first, Verse 6, uh, we're weak, we're messed up, he died for us. Two, we're sinners, yet he still loved us. Verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since th therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath to come. This is the third thing, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were against God, shaking our fists against God, hating God, rebelling against God, still and like that, we were still, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more that we should be reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. The fact is, hey, Jesus died for me, tells me how much He loves me. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I get, it's so amazing what God has done for us through what Jesus did at the cross. I mean, we just believe in Jesus. We get forgiveness of sin. We get cleansing. He makes us a new person in Christ. He gives us his peace, his, his presence, his, his, his purpose, his power, he, he, all that stuff. He, and he gives us uh, eternal life. We get heaven. We get all of that. Actually, the Bible says we get everything in the, uh, in the spiritual heavenlies. Uh, uh, everything God is in Jesus Christ, we to get. And what's amazing is it's all free. But somebody paid for it. And the only way I get any of that is because Jesus Christ, who did not deserve to die, took my place, who deserved to die. He died on a cross for me to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, to come in, to make me, to give me a new life, and to give me the gift of everlasting life with him in heaven. Every time you see a cross, and you see crosses all over it, you're every day, but you know what? That cross all reminds you God loves you. God values you. Jesus Christ died for you on a cross. I discovered he loves me. God created me. Jesus Christ died for me. And third, God has picked me. He's chosen me. He's chosen you. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. Now, I always thought... Now. Uh, you know how awesome it is to be picked. I mean, we just had, and I know most of you don't even care about this, but we just had the NFL draft, which is all about being good enough to be chosen. 
And how awesome it is to be good enough to be chosen with the first pick in the first round as the number one pick in the whole draft. That's pretty awesome. But you know what? Most of us spend our life and we realize I'm never going to get picked. Always overlooked. Always somebody else. Always something else going on. It just, and nobody chooses me. Here's what I want you to realize. There's a God in heaven who has chosen you. He's created you. He's got a plan for your life with who you are and with what you have and what he wants to do. God can and God will. I spent most of my life struggling with feeling loved, but secondly, just assuming there's not going to be a place for me in this whole thing because I can't talk. I mean, I can't say anything. I was a senior in high school when I first started sensing God had called me to preach. Now, when I was a senior in high school, I stuttered so well, I couldn't even say a silent prayer with that stuttering. <clears throat> Much less speaking, but there's no way. And I said, there's not going to be a plan. He can't, because of my stutter, God can't use me. I'm in a little singing group in my church up at, this is back in the 60s, and uh, my uh, home church up in Kansas City, and we're doing a concert one Sunday night at the Warnell Road a Baptist Church in downtown Kansas City. About 30 of us in this little youth choir, and we're singing up there. And about halfway through, our director, whose name was Larry J. Winter, he stops the concert, and for some reason he just says, hey, these are great students in this choir, great high school. I want you to meet them. Hey, students, I want you to say your name, say where you go to high school, and what grade you're in. Because as soon as he said that, I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Well, it comes to me, I'm trying to say, I'm Neil Jeffrey. I'm a senior at Shawnee Mission South High School, but nothing's coming out. I mean, I'm in a major stutter. I'm just a major block. And of course, what you do in a moment like that, you see the faces of all the, of the people out there looking, and of course, your head's bobbing, your mouth's open, and nothing's coming out, and you start, you can feel the, the embarrassment and all your friends in the choir, and I mean, I just, I just, because what you, it, you do in a moment like that, that you panic. And of course, you get tense. It makes it even worse. Well, after what seemed to be, uh, uh, an eternity, Larry J., our director, uh, interrupted me, <clears throat> although technically it was not an interruption. <laughs> because obviously I hadn't even said anything. But he says on my behalf, that's Neil Jeffrey. He's a senior at Shawnee Mission South High School. One of the most humiliating experiences of my life. I felt so stupid. I felt so inadequate. I said, there's not going to be a place for me. There's nothing I can do. I can't do anything. Again, I felt stupid, and I felt ugly in that moment. Well, the next year, I'm a freshman at Baylor. God's still working in my heart, and I don't know how this is going to happen, but I'm still doing the thing, but I'm involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. FCA had a national weekend of champions in Lubbock on the Tech campus. And on that, we get out there on that, a bunch of us college athletes from Baylor went, as they did from all over America, Pro college, and I mean, there were thousands were there. I discovered that uh, FCA was having a uh, a coach or athlete give a testimony in every church on that Sunday morning in the whole city of Lubbock. Well, I saw that somebody had made a mistake and assigned me a church to give a testimony. In. So I spent all weekend trying to get out of it, trying to make an excuse. And all of a sudden, it's Sunday morning. I realized I got to do this. I, I'm at this little church outside of the city of Lubbock. About to get introduced, and I remember thinking, God, you got to do something. You got to blow up the sound system or, you know, just, <laughs> just, a, just a little fire someplace, but just kind of stop. Now, stop what's going to happen. This is going to be a disaster. Well, I get introduced. I walk in, open my mouth. For the first time in my life, I spoke maybe three, five, six, seven minutes without a stutter. I mean, it just flowed out of me. I mean, I had never experienced fluid speech before. In fact, I remember thinking that Sunday morning as I was speaking, who is this? Because I had never spoken fluently. No attention in my cords or, or, or chest vocal cords. I mean, it, it just flowed out of me. In fact, to be honest, I've not spoken that well since that morning in March of 1973. But when I sat down, you know what I discovered? When I said after that experience, I had not discovered how great Neil Jeffrey is because I know Neil Jeffrey can't do that. 
When I said that, I had just discovered what God can do. And you know what? God can do anything with anybody if that anyone will just say yes to Jesus. And yes, God, I'm coming to you, and I, I'm the most dysfunctional person on the planet. I'm the most insecure person on the planet. I'm just, I'm this, I'm that, and there's no way. But, but the bottom line, you know, you know what God does? This is the miracle of who God is. God all of a sudden works in our heart and lives, and you know what he does? First of all, you know what he does? He works in us, and all of a sudden we discover who God created me to be. You know what? I have finally discovered, and you know how awesome this is? How awesome it is, it is not to be Mark Mentier, Randy Fagan, and Steve Thomas, and uh, all those other guys. You know what I've discovered? How awesome it is to be who Neil Jeffrey is in Christ. Man, that's a whole nother way to live. I spent most of my life being so insecure, I'd walk in a room, just about any room, and just, just hoping someone was going to say hi to me. Walk in, just walk in the place. I'd like the day. Hey, is anybody going to say hi to me? Well, I mean, nobody knew me, but, 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 but all through grade school, junior high, and then high school, and kind of, I'd, I'd walk through things and just hope, hey, somebody say hi to me. Somebody accept me. Somebody validate me. You know how awesome it is to realize I've been, I've already been validated. Man, Jesus Christ created me, died for me, had a plan for my life. I got the Holy Spirit in me. He's doing some stuff in me to accomplish for his, my good, his glory, and how awesome it is to walk in a room and to realize, hey, I'm not here to have anybody recognize me. I'm here to recognize everybody else. I'm not here to be blessed by him. I'm here to be a blessing. Hey, I don't care if anybody, now it's always nice if someone says hi to you, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to say hi to people. Why? Because I realize I'm not here. And you know what else I've struggled with as well? I was, now, I'm dysfunctional. I admit that I know that. And you know, that's one of the things I, uh, I like about myself. I know who I am. But, but you know, I've spent most of my life looking to other people, looking, not you, but, but other people, <laughs> and basing how I feel about myself based on how I think they feel about me. You know what the problem with that is? I have finally discovered. I'm looking to others. I, I'm messed up. I'm looking for them to base how I feel about me based on how I think they feel about me. And the bottom line reality is they're more screwed up than I am. <laughs> Everybody's like that. Not, uh, some people hide it well, and, it, and of course, in our world today, I mean, it's so crazy and bizarre, but hey, it doesn't matter. It is awesome to reach a place in life that I discover I am precious to the Father. He's got a plan for my life, and my job is just to trust Him. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how I got here, except, because when I was a sophomore in high school, I guarantee you, you don't call Neil Jeffrey to come and, and, and preach to this church. But God does. That's the point. And God can do anything with anybody. You know, a great verse that uh, I come to really love is James 1, 2 through 4. You know what James 1, 2 through 4 says? It says, consider all joy when you encounter various trials. Consider it all for joy when you uh, encounter various trials. He says, rejoice when you have tough things. It's essentially saying, hey, Neil Jeffrey, you got a stutter? You got a various trial, you got a stuff. Hey, he says, rejoice. Respond in a positive way. Why? Because we got a God who's bigger than this thing, who's greater than this thing. He's going to accomplish uh, something awesome in this thing, through this thing, uh, for my good, for a witness to the world, and to bring honor and glory to Him. It says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, because the testing of your faith produces endurance, produces steadfastness. And then it says, let the endurance or steadfastness have its full effect in you, and the full effect is that you might be, listen to this, you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, those are three pretty awesome thoughts right there. Everybody wants to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How do you get there? You're not born that way. You 
get there through the various trials of life. Going through this thing, the struggle of my life, I've discovered, you discover that God, God is making us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, which may mean perfect, I become everything God created me to be. Complete, I do everything God created me to do. Lacking in nothing means I can do anything by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit of the living God who lives within me. That's why the Apostle Paul was able to say, because he knew through all the trials in his life, he knew I'm perfectly complete, lacking in nothing. He could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, I look back over my life after all these years and I realize, you know what? In some weird way, and again, I don't have all the answers. I can't explain everything, and I, I can't, but you know what? It's pretty cool being the stuttering quarterback preacher guy who doesn't talk as well as most to preachers do, but you know what? Most preachers don't stutter as well as I do. That's, that's the <laughs> point. Unique, complete in Christ Jesus. Hey, you know one more little verse? And uh, i got to stop just because our time is... Uh, but you know, a great little verse. And to be honest, uh, I have read this verse a bunch of times, but just in the last couple of years, uh, I've discovered this. First Peter, he's again, he's speaking about trials. And uh, he says this, uh, verse 6, First Peter 1, he says, In this you rejoice. Of course, Oh, it's the trials he's speaking about. It's like James 1, 2, 3, 4, kind of all joy and kind of various trials. He's saying that also. Rejoice. In this rejoice. Though, uh, trials he's speaking about. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. What I saw that I really had never seen before until the last couple of years is that little phrase, if necessary. You know what? I guess all that means this. I could ask the Lord Jesus, Lord, is this whole stuttering thing I've had all my life, has this really been necessary? You know what I guess Jesus would say? <laughs> Just like a loving father would say? Yes, my son. This was necessary. Remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to go to the cross. And you remember he asked the Lord, Lord, if there's any way, take this cup from me. God, I don't want to do it. He's actually saying this, Lord, is this really necessary? You know what God told him? Yes, my son. It's necessary. Okay, but, but son, I'm going to accomplish the resurre your resurrection, the salvation of all those who are going to believe for all of eternity, yes, this is. You know, the Apostle Paul had a thorn. Remember that in the Bible? He had this thorn in his life, you know this thing? And Paul says, yes, the Lord, three times. Lord, take this thorn away. Why do I have to have this thorn? I've asked the Lord hundreds of times, if not a thousand times through my life. Hey, why do I have to have this thorn? Why this? Paul asked, Lord, take it away. You know what uh, uh, God told him? And I guess he's telling me the same thing. Obviously, he could say, hey, Paul, I could take this thing away. It, 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 that'd be simple to me, uh, uh, for me to do. Just, uh, I, I could just say the word, and it's gone. I could do it. But Paul, you would never have experienced that my grace is sufficient for you. Actually, you would never know that if you didn't have this thorn in your life. Neil Jeffrey, you would never have known my grace and the power of my grace, how it's always sufficient, it's always enough if you didn't have it. And you're also going to discover this, he told Paul. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, he says this, hey, um, my power, he says, is actually made perfect in your weakness. He would never have discovered the power of Christ in his life to be everything he wanted to be. You know, it's like this, it's like Paul says after that, then I would rather boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what he's actually saying? He's saying this, hey, now that I realize what God has done because of this thing in my life and this, this thing is necessary, you know what I realize? Hey, if I got a choice between 
not having the thorn because I don't have the thorn, I don't experience the power of Christ in my life and experience His grace. Or if I could have the thorn because I get the thorn, I experience God's grace and I experience His power in my life. Paul was saying, give me the thorn. Necessary. I realize now this was God's plan for my life. The struggle in this to one Conform me to the image of his son. That's what he wants to do in your life and my life. Romans 8, 28, 29. To be a witness to the world of what a man does if he's got a stutter, if he's got whatever you've got in the situation. Oh, what do you do in ultimately? To bring honor and glory to him. And God can get glory through anything. I feel this. I surrender it to him. Hey, <laughs> I am secure. But God's not. And in a relationship with him, I can experience the fullness of being everything God created me to be. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment, and we're going to have just a little brief time of invitation. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, heads bowed, eyes closed. Uh, obviously, I don't know. Your situation, I don't even know you, but you know God does. And your struggle has always been with whatever it is. And God, th th this may be God's moment for you to experience a major victory in your life. Of just realizing, hey, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. Hey, I'm selfish, uh, I need a Spirit-filled work in my heart and life. And... I am struggling with everything in my life. I need a conqueror. Uh, uh, I need a victor. I need a victory. And that victory is Jesus Christ who conquered life, who conquered death, conquered the grave, and gives victory to all those who believe. There may be a person, a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl this moment, and what God has, has said to you, hey, God says, I am everything you need in your life. All you need to do it is ask Jesus to forgive you your sins. Come into your heart, into your life. And you know what he does? He steps out of heaven, steps into your heart. And we believe and become born again. And the end result is we become a new creation in Christ. There's some here today, that's the commitment you need to make. In just a moment, after I pray, I'm going to have you stand. We're going to sing. And I want you to come forward and just <laughs> tell one of these guys up here, hey, I need Jesus. I need a commitment to uh, of my life to Christ. Uh, some here, you're a Christian, as I was for a long, long time, but I was struggling, feeling so insecure. God wants to do a whole new thing in your heart, in your life, in who you are, who God committed you to be. And maybe there's someone here today say, you know what? Hey, I'm starting a new beginning. I'm, I'm turning my life over to Jesus. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. But I'm turning it all over to him, and I want him to do in me, with me, for me, and through me anything and everything he wants me to do. And to even to take my greatest struggle and ultimately make it the greatest point of witness in my heart and life for Jesus. So just a moment, why don't you come? Just recommit your life to Christ. Have prayer. There, we'll pray with you, whatever it is. I'm sure there's some who just, you've been praying about a church home, and I'm not exactly sure how we do it here at this church. But if you want to, be a member here and just be a part. Just plug your lives, your family here in, in this place. You can come and talk to one of these as well. Or we just need prayer. God, I'm asking you to speak, uh, just to say something that every one of us in the room needs to hear. And God, may we hear it. And when we hear it, may we receive it. And may we respond and do whatever you tell us to do, even if it's getting up and getting in the aisle and going down front and making a decision. God, help us to do what you've asked us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you? Thank you so much for being here with us today online at United City. If you made a decision, we want you to text NEXT to the number on the screen. It's not a robot following up with you. It's 100% one of our staff members. So please let us help you take your next step. We hope to see you here soon. Have a great day.